Good evening. May I present my wife, Kathy? Good evening. I think everyone enjoys reading. Our tastes vary according to author, type of work, and so forth. Some of us like murders or poetry. And some biography or historical novels. In radio, because of time limitations, we find ourselves occupied mostly with short stories. Which brings us to tonight. Henry James is probably one of the masters of that difficult form of writing, the short story. And tonight we have selected for you one of his loveliest. Four Meetings by Henry James. I saw her but four times, though I remember them vividly. She made her impression on me. I thought her very pretty and very interesting, a touching specimen of a type with which I'd had other and perhaps less charming associations. I'm sorry to hear of her death. The first meeting was in the country at a small party one snowy night just at the turn of the century. I'd been invited to the house of a friend for Christmas time. I'd never been in the depths of New England at that season. To me, it was really full of savor. It had been snowing all day on the town of North Verona, and the drifts were knee-high. And inside the large house, the party, the cheer, and the girls quite excited by the attraction of a gentleman from New York. And presently, I was introduced to her, to Miss Carolyn Spencer. You'll forgive me. For what, Miss Spencer? I've asked about you. Oh? I had heard you'd been to Europe. So I asked Mrs. Latouche. She said that was quite correct. And it is, isn't it? That I've been to Europe? Yes. Have you been very long over there? Well, it mounts up, put all the times together. And you've traveled everywhere. I've traveled a good deal. I'm very fond of it and happily have been able. And you know foreign languages? After a fashion. Is it hard to speak them? I don't imagine you'd find it so. Please? Yes. I brought something with me, a portfolio, when I heard there'd be a gentleman here this evening who'd been to Europe. A portfolio? Photographs that I've purchased or have been given. Views of Switzerland, Italy, and Spain, landscapes, and some very fine reproductions of famous buildings, pictures, and statues. Yes. Will you look at them with me now? And tell me about these places. Of course, but... I'll get them. We'll sit in the library, and you will tell me all about them. It struck me then, a thing about her, a small, vague smile, a discreet, a disguised yearning, which seemed somehow at odds with her isolation. While I waited for her to return with the portfolio, someone told me about her, that she was artistic... That is, as far as this small community could allow for such yearnings or could minister to them. Miss Carolyn Spencer was, I judged, close on to 30. She was not quite a beauty, but was nonetheless, in her small, odd way, formed to please. And I thought, as she approached me with the portfolio under her arm, how like a child she was. We went into the library and sat down. Do you know this place? Oh, yes. I've been there many a time. The Villa of Medici in Venezia, Venice. And I've seen it just as in this photograph. The poet Byron yes, once... Yes, I know. You see, I'm a schoolteacher. And these, the Alps. Are they so beautiful? Really? Yes. This one, the Jungfrau. Many times I've sat by the window of a chalet and sipped Swiss chocolate and... Enchanting. How soon must I go to Europe? Oh, I'll give you ten years. Well, I guess I can go in that time. You'll enjoy it immensely. You'll find it of the highest interest. They say the French theater's very beautiful. The best in the world. Did you go there often? When I was first in Paris, I went every night. Every night? That to me is... is as if you tell me a fairy tale. But it's all very expensive, isn't it? Europe, you mean? Going there and traveling. That's been the trouble. I've very little money. One can manage with a moderate amount wisely spent, Miss Spencer. I've saved and saved up, and I'm always adding a little to it. It's all for that. Yet... Yes? You see, it hasn't only been the money. It has been everything. Everything has acted against it. I've waited and waited... It's been my castle in the air. 
I'm almost afraid to talk about it. Two or three times it has come a little nearer, and then I've talked about it, and it has melted away. I've talked about it too much. Perhaps. But the cure is just to go. I'll go sometime, all right. I've a relative right there on the spot, and he'll know how to control me. I'll need someone like that. I've read histories and guidebooks and articles. I know I shall rave about everything. You and I. Yes? We've the great American disease, the appetite for color and form, for the picturesque and romantic at any price. Travelers in a desert, subject to the terrible mirage, the torment of illusion, thirst fever, the things of dreams. And finally, when at last we do see these things, we simply recognize them. What experience does is merely to confirm and concentrate our dream. The way you express it is too lovely. Then you'll be going back. One has to go back. I shall look for you. Yes. And I'll tell you if I'm disappointed. A few months after this, I crossed the sea eastward again, and some three years elapsed. I'd been living in Paris, and toward the end of October, went from that city to La Havre to meet some friends who had written me they were about to arrive there. I found the steamer already docked. I was two or three hours late. The early autumn day was warm and charming, and I decided to walk to the hotel where my travelers were duly established. The stroll through the bright-colored, busy streets of the old French seaport was beguiling enough. The sunny, noisy quays, the turn into a wide, pleasant street which lay half in sun and half in shade. A French provincial street that resembled an old watercolor drawing. Then stopped suddenly to stare just before reaching a quiet old-world cafe where under an awning several tables and chairs were disposed. A lady, seated alone outside at one of the little marble-topped tables. Something had been put before her, but she only leaned back, motionless and with her hands folded, looking down the street and away from me. I saw her but in diminished profile. Nevertheless, I was sure I knew on the spot that we must already have met. She now turned to face a little more into profile, looking at the steep gray house front opposite. There was no sign of her being older. She was as gravely, decently, demurely pretty as before. On this, I decided to speak to her. Well, Miss Spencer, you've achieved your dream. I hope you're not disappointed. I'm sorry, but I do. I'm sorry. I don't know you. You don't recognize me. You once showed me your photographs of Europe at a dance in North Verona. It's been three years. To you? Years. Yes, to me. Of course. Of course it was you. And this happens very charmingly, for isn't it quite proper for me to give you a formal reception here, the official welcome? I talked to you so much about Europe. You didn't say too much. I'm so intensely happy. When did you arrive? How long have... On the steamer this morning. I don't know how long I've been here. I don't know. How fortunate it is. What? It's of the miraculous that I should be here, meet you here, receive your very first impressions. Oh, I can't tell you. I feel so much in a dream. I've been sitting here and I don't want to move everything. So delicious and romantic. First impressions. I've lost my... I don't know whether the coffee has gone to my head. It's so unlike the coffee of my dead past. A word of caution, Miss Spencer. Yes. Don't spend your appreciation all the first day. Remember, it's your intellectual letter of credit. Remember all the beautiful places and things that are waiting for you. And that lovely Italy we talked about. Don't spend it all the first day. I'm not afraid of running short. I could sit here all day just saying to myself that here I am at last. It's so dark and strange, so old and different. By the way, how come you to be encamped in this odd place? Haven't you gone to one of the inns? My cousin brought me here and a little while ago left me. Your cousin? I told you I had a relation over here, a real cousin. So splendid. An art student in Paris. I thought he'd meet me at the train in Paris, but he came to the ship. He's very kind and very bright. He met you 
then went away from you, left you here alone. Only to take my money to the bank. All your money? But of course. It must be changed into French money. He explained that to me. And how, how the... long have you been waiting for him? Oh, he came back a little while ago. And then a, a, a brilliant scarlet bit of cloth hanging from a window in that building across the street caught his eye. And he said to me, he must have it, must buy it. And he said, wait for him a little more. And now he's inside there. And your money? Oh, it's quite safe, let me assure you. Where is it? In my cousin's pocket. I'm eager to meet this bright, kind cousin who is an art student, Miss Spencer. Will you... It would be of deep delight to me. Your arm. And as we crossed the wide provincial street, a man came out the house, saw us, stopped, leaned in languor against the old doorway. The moment my eyes rested on him, I knew he could be but the bright, if not the kind, cousin, the art student. He wore a slouch hat and a rusty black velvet jacket. His shirt collar displayed a stretch of throat that wasn't strikingly statuesque. He was tall and lean. He had red hair and freckles. And about his waist was a winding of scarlet cloth whose ends hung against his thigh, gondolier fashion. When I was introduced to him as an old acquaintance of Miss Spencer's, he looked at me hard with a pair of small, sharp eyes from under the romantic brim of his hat. Then, bowing a sweep, gave me a solemn wave in the European fashion of his rather rusty sombrero. You weren't on Carolyn's ship? No, I wasn't on the ship. I've been in Europe these several years. I see. Look, Carolyn, the bit of cloth the concierge hung from the window. We haggled for it, and I've won. You like it? It's beautiful. And the way you wear it, so dashing, so romantic. I see you've a great deal of eye. Your cousin tells me you're studying art. At the Paris studio, one of the very great men. Do you understand French? Some kinds. Moi, je suis fou de la peinture. Oh, I understand that. Uh, it means you are, um, you are mad for painting. Is that right? Very good, Miss Spencer. Oh, what a delight it will be to live among people who are on such easy terms with foreign tongues as you two are. French, Italian... Carolyn. Yes. Resign yourself, dear cousin, only to a smattering of French. Only that. The Italian of Spezia and Pisa, Florence and Rome, I fear perhaps you will not hear. And not have the opportunity to learn. What? I don't understand. What are you saying? There is grave trouble. A cutting of deep trouble, cousin mine. Come to the hotel I've arranged for you. I will tell you about it. Come, dear cousin. Wait. I'll want to meet you again, Miss Spencer. Where? À la belle Normande. Well, I congratulate you. I believe it's the best inn in the world. <laughs> I guess I know my way around. Venez-vous, cousine. Come. Later that same day was our third meeting. The autumn dusk had begun to fall on the city and later on the ships and on the wings of the harbor birds. At this time, I found myself at liberty to call at the hotel named to me by the cousin of Carolyn Spencer. I must confess that I spent much of the walk from my hotel to theirs in wondering what the disagreeable thing was that the less attractive of these had to tell the other. The Belle Normande was local color in abundance. A small, trickling fountain with a stucco statuette set in the midst of it. And on a green bench outside an open door, Carolyn Spencer, supported by the back of her bench, with her hands clasped in her lap, her eyes on the other side of the court, where the landlady manipulated apricots. Miss Spencer, staring absently, thoughtfully. Oh... Good evening. Bonne nuit. I thought you might have gone from the... Please sit down. She had been crying, and her face was sad and without surprise at me. I had no wish to incommode you. It was generous of you to come to. Your cousin has been giving you bad news. You've had a horrid time. It shows. It shows, then, that I have wept. Miss Spencer... There will be no more tears, I assure you. I have shed them all. I am composed. Then it's true. You have been having a bad time. My poor cousin has been having one. 
He has had great worries. That trouble he spoke of before you, it's bad. Very bad. A young man like that, art student with the great trouble for a young man who is so bright, so... He was in dreadful want of money. In want of yours, you mean? Of any he could get. Honorably, of course. Mine is all. Well, that's available. And he has taken it from you. I gave him what I had. Do you call that his getting it honorably? We won't speak of it. Perhaps I go too far, but we must speak of it. Miss Spencer. Yes? I'm your friend. Upon my word, I'm your protector. It seems to me you need one. What is the matter with this extraordinary person? My cousin? He's just badly in debt. No doubt he is. Why must you pay for that? Well, he has told me all his story. I feel for him so much. Well, so do I, if you come to that. But I hope... Yes? I hope he'll give you straight back your money. Certainly he will, as soon as ever he can. And when the deuce will that be? When he has finished his great picture. My dear young lady, great picture? Where is he? There, in the salle manger, the dining room, eating alone. You can see him if you... And that turn... pyramid of apricots the woman has arranged on a plate for your cousin, that nice little plate of fruit for him... They seem to do everything so nicely here. Oh, come now, really. Do you think it decent that that long, strong fellow should collar your funds? He made his debts himself. He ought to... He has signed notes to a large amount. The more fool he. He's in real distress, believe it. And it's not only himself. It's his poor young wife. Ah. He has told you he has a poor young wife. I didn't know, but he made a clean breast of it. He married two years since, secretly. Why secretly? She was a countess. Are you very sure of that? She has written me the most beautiful letter. Asking you, whom she has never seen, for money? Asking me for confidence and sympathy. Oh, really, Miss Spencer. Listen to me, please. The countess has been cruelly treated by her family because of what she has done for my cousin. She appeals to me in her own lovely way in the letter which I have here. Such a wonderful old world romance. A beautiful young widow. Her first husband was a count, tremendously high-born, and his death left her ruined. He was a wicked man and profligate. And her great aunt, the old Marchesa, from whom she had expectations of great wealth... And still to sacrifice that for the love of my cousin. For their grand passion to be cast off from them. Ah. My cousin has finished his dinner and he comes to us. You... You will not stay to speak with him? No, then. Decidedly, I couldn't stand it. And without responding, I gave my hand to my friend. She looked at me an instant with her little white face and rounded eyes. And as she showed her pretty teeth, I suppose she meant to smile. Don't be sorry for me. I'm very sure I shall see something of this dear old Europe yet. I refused, however, to take literal leave of her. I should find a moment to come back next morning. Then her awful kinsman was approaching and flourishing his sombrero at me by way of a bow, on which I hurried away. On the morrow early, I did return, and in the court of the inn met the concierge. Bonjour, monsieur. Que voulez? Your wish. Uh, Mademoiselle Spencer, Carolyn Spencer, will you inform her, please, that a gentleman is in the courtyard inquiring for her? But the Mademoiselle Partier, she is gone from here. What? At ten o'clock of last night, she went away. Well, she left for Paris, then? <laughs> it would be a very strange way to go to Paris. What are you talking about? With her, uh, what she say, cousin. He took her to the ship, the American ship in the harbor. He sailed. He waved farewell. He went perhaps to Paris, not... You mean she sailed for America last night? Oui. Back to America. Ah, uh, the pitiable child. To come to Europe, to France, to meet a monsieur, a cousin, and to stay only 13 hours. Thirteen hours of a lifetime of waiting.
I myself, more fortunate, remained in Europe for a period of some five years. Then one of the first things I did on my return to America was to go to North Verona to renew old acquaintances, and immediately I went to the residence of Miss Carolyn Spencer. I saw the poor little house to be of the shabbiest and felt a sudden doubt of my right to penetrate since curiosity had been my motive, but in the open doorway stood Miss Spencer. She looked tired and wasted. Yes, sir? I waited for you over there to come back, but you never came. Waited? Where, sir? I waited at the old French port. I remember you now. I remember that day. I kept looking out for you year after year. You mean in Europe? In Europe, of course. Please come in. Thank you. In here. Have you been in Europe ever since? Until three weeks ago. And you? I'm very rude. Won't you sit down? And you? You, you never came back? Oh, no. 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 But you remind me. I remind you of that miserable day at the Arve, do I not? It wasn't miserable. It was delightful. Did you come straight back here? I was back here just 30 days after my first start. I've remained here ever since. Every minute of the time. Miss Spencer. Yes? The tour you've always dreamed of. When then are you going to make it? Never. I hope at least your cousin repaid you that money. I don't care for it now. For Europe. Everything's different. I never think of it. He never repaid you then? Please, please. Pardon, ma chère. I did not know you had company. The gentleman come in so quietly. Yes, he... It's only to speak of my café. Monsieur Mixter and I should like it served in the garden, under the petit table. Come along, Monsieur Mixter. Oui. Who in the world is that? The Countess. The Countess? The wife of my cousin you met, in France. Well, who's the young man with her? The Countess's pupil. She gives him lessons in French and music. Oh. You see... She has had the worst reverses, with no one to look to. Where is her husband, your cousin? Dead. And where is your money? I don't know. I don't know. On her husband's death, this lady came at once to you, is that correct? Yes, at once she appeared. It was one day three years ago, and she's been here ever since. How does she like it here? Please pardon me. I must get her coffee. Left alone in the little parlor, I found myself divided between the perfection of my disgust and the contrary wish to see, to learn more. And I thought I should talk to this countess, this woman in the faded pink wrapper, this very large lady of middle age with the plump, dead white face and the tightly drawn back hair. So I went out into the garden to where she was seated under the quince tree, to where she was engaged in drawing a fine needle with a very fat hand through a piece of embroidery not remarkable for freshness. Mr. Mixter had accommodated himself at her feet, learning. When she saw me, she stopped him with a touch of her hand. Ah, voila. I'm sure you speak French, monsieur. I do, madame. I knew it as soon as I looked at you. You have been to my poor, dear country. A considerable time and quite recently. And you know very well. Oui. He's talking French. Oh, it's going on ten months since I took Monsieur Mixter in there. I hope your other students do you more honor. But I have no others. Monsieur, talk to me of Paris. Mon beau Paris that I give my eyes to see. What are they doing there now? Amusing themselves a great deal, as always. Ah. At the theater, at the café concert, sous le beau ciel, at the little table. Quelle existence. And now you're in exile. You may imagine what it is. For an hour on the boulevard, Paris. But this, this Verona, you may imagine. Three years of this. But I shall get used to it. For instance, the coffee. Do you always have coffee at this hour? At what hour would you propose me to have it? I must have my little cup after breakfast. And you breakfast at this hour, midday? Certainement. Ah, oh, she brings it. My cousin. 
C'est un fille très charmant, but the coffee is not nearly as good if you have drunk it on the boulevard. I've brought an extra cup. No, no, thank you, Miss Spencer. I must be leaving. Yes. And what passed between us, between Miss Spencer and me, while she looked up at me, I think was this. The knowledge that I had seen in her set little face, extreme fatigue... And also something else strange and conceived, whether a desperate patient still or at, at last some other desperation being more than I can say. What was clearest was that she was glad I was going. That was our last meeting. That was some years ago. I was sorry yesterday to hear of her death. And yet, when I think of it, why should I be? We were pleased tonight to have Jeanette Nolan join us for the first time. To play the Countess. And to welcome back Byron Kane, the concierge. And Ben Wright, Carolyn's unattractive cousin. Next week, a dramatic script by a comedy writer. Bob Sweeney, comedian and writer of comedy to most of you, tried his hand at the documentary form of drama and submitted an exciting report about a policewoman. Which Kathy and I will present next week. And if our luck holds, Bob will come in and act in his own effort. Until next week, then, thank you for listening, and good night. Good night. <laughs>